Well, here we are and welcome back to the Waffle Free Storytelling Podcast. It's Tina Constant here. As always, if you want the waffle, then head on down to the show notes or go and visit www.tinaconstant.com for all the chat and to just say hi. But in the meantime, I don't have to tell you how crazy this week has been, so we're going to jump right into the story. And this week, the story is all about Jack and Jemima, who were friends. And a vandalous pair from the very day they met. Their mission was to cause pure havoc. Not necessarily out of badness, but because it was more interesting than what anyone else was doing. But because of when they lived, their place in history and their role in the making of life as we know it has never fully been told. You see, Jack and Jemima were born at a time when there were very few people in the world compared to now. It was a time when the gods of myths and legends ran things, and they found that small numbers of people were much easier to manage. It was a time when humans were an experiment. We were a novelty, a bit like an ant farm or hamsters on a wheel or tiny little worker bees. And indeed, that's what humans were, workers for the gods. Humans at the time were given the single aim of feeding themselves and their masters and to make sure that they didn't get any ideas about doing anything different or better, they were given only just enough skill to achieve that objective if they worked all hours of the sun. So it was that people only thought of one thing. They thought of food. Planting it, growing it, picking it, preparing it, consuming it, giving half of it to the gods, and then growing it again. They quickly learned that missing one harvest or delaying the start of any season led to struggle and starvation. To the gods, the balance was exquisite. They got lavish supplies for their feasts and entertainment all in one place. They enjoyed watching humans struggle with what little they were given. And if it looked like things were getting just too easy, then the gods would send down a storm or high winds or baking heat or dark winters until humans learned their place once more. For the gods, it was a bit of fun. For humans, it was life. But Jack and Jemima knew the balance wasn't right. They knew there had to be more. So from a very tender age, they began to do what no one of our kind had ever done before. They began to think and plot and plan and scheme. They began to wonder whether they could shift the balance and take power from their rulers. Now, like all humans, Jack and Jemima had been to the Valley of the Gods. Every year, all of humanity had to make the pilgrimage to the valley to give the gods half of what they'd grown. In exchange, people could ask questions, and the gods would consult huge volumes of books and lengths of scrolls to give them an answer, but only if it suited them. These books, they were the source of the gods' power. That's what Jack and Jemima wanted that they were sure would free mankind. So, with every visit, Jack and Jemima studied the walls and the landscape and the security and the might of the place. All they needed was to find one single tiny crack to crawl through. And after years of bowing down, Jack and Jemima finally found their way in. It was a small hole in the wall on the west side of the fortress. The hole led into a tunnel which led all the way into the great hall itself. Jack and Jemima knew they couldn't just stroll in. They knew they needed to distract the gods. So they invented a holiday. 
a reason to celebrate. They told the people that the idea had come from the gods, and they told the gods the idea had come from the people. As a result, on the agreed day, the gods and all of humanity gathered in a great amphitheater where Jack and Jemima had put on a show second to none. Lights and fireworks, great banquets, dances and acrobats. It was an event the likes of which neither God nor man had ever seen before. While everyone got steadily fat and drunk, Jack and Jemima left the festivities and snuck into the valley of the gods. In the dark, Hidden by trees and shadows, the pair crept along the walls and into the tunnel that opened to the great hall. Silent and still, empty and quiet, Jack and Jemima entered the place where no humans dared tread. They went unnoticed and unseen by all except one. High in the mountains sat the great mother dragon herself. She watched as Jack and Jemima crept through the halls. She smiled as they gasped at the great rooms filled with food and gold and silver, jewels and treasures that the gods had hoarded. She frowned when Jack and Jemima ignored those glittering things and kept going until they came to the library. The dragon leaned forward on her perch and watched as Jack and Jemima slipped through a crack in the door, entered the library and began to scan the shelves. Book after book, scroll after scroll, all of it filled with knowledge. How to make light, how to make water, how to make air, how to heal, how to create and build and grow, how to make wealth and happiness, joy and life itself. Everything that humans thought were miracles was just know-how. Jack and Jemima stared at the shelves, this was far more than they imagined. But it was also too much. Even now, from far away, they heard the gods returning to the valley. The books were too big. The scrolls were too long. Take what you can, whispered Jack. So the pair ran through the library, ripping pages from every single book. They didn't look to see what they had taken. They just hoped it would be enough. Either way, it was more than they had before. But time was running out. The gods had grown tired of the festivities and were coming home. As they got closer, Jack and Jemima realized they'd need a miracle if they were going to get out in one piece. If the gods found them, they would never survive. The great dragon smiled at the human's audacity and daring. She watched the gods amble and stumble into their gates. She watched Jack and Jemima search for a safe way out. And just as they were about to be discovered, she swooped down and hid them from the gods. Then she turned to Jack and Jemima. They both closed their eyes and waited for death. What else was possible? But instead, the dragon reached into the library and pulled out one more book. It was smaller, easier to carry. On the cover, in small grey letters, were the words, How to Make Magic. The dragon bore down on the pair of terrified humans. I will help you, she said, on one condition. 
Take the knowledge you have here and use it well. Share it. Never hoard it. Spread it amongst humanity. Unaltered, unedited. If you do that, you and your kind will live forever. Then the dragon breathed on the pages, the scrolls and the book on magic. If you don't, she said, every hundred years my breath will turn to pestilence and it will destroy you. With the gods filling the halls again, Jack and Jemima agreed to the terms and accepted help from the dragon. Back amongst the people, Jack and Jemima used the knowledge on those pages to change everything about how people lived. Now, of course, they didn't have the full books, just bits and pieces, scraps and pages. So it was trial and error. But even with those few pages, they grew and flourished no matter what the gods threw at them. The only book they didn't open, perhaps because it was small and grey and hadn't come directly from the gods, was the book titled How to Make Magic. That gathered dust on the shelves. Everything else, though, as promised to the dragon, was open to the world, freely available, unedited and unchanged. Over time, however, that became a problem. The more hands that touched those precious pages, the more worn they became. And there came a day when Jack and Jemima decided... For the good of future generations and the knowledge on those pages, to put them in a glass case. And instead of people reading the pages for themselves, Jack and Jemima would do it for them. For a fee. And that is when Jack and Jemima learned something about their friends and neighbours. They realised that people would pay more to hear what they wanted to hear. So instead of relating the words as they were on the pages, Jack and Jemima changed them, altered them, reinterpreted them. And the people paid gold and silver, even their first-born children. Jack and Jemima grew greedy and demanded more and more, but gave less and less. They took those first-born children and put them to work, cooking, cleaning, washing and feeding Jack and Jemima until they became bloated, fat and lazy. And from the mountaintop, the dragon watched. And she grew enraged. And then she did what she said she would do. With a single breath, the great dragon released a pestilence. Jack and Jemima were the first to breathe it in, and in a moment were struck dumb, unable to think, unable to speak, unable to move. The dragon's breath spread across the land, touching every man, woman and child, except one. Sizuru. She was the first child of a poor family who couldn't afford the gold and silver Jack and Jemima had demanded. When the poison spread, Suzuru had been trapped in the glass room that encased the pages and the scrolls stolen from the gods. She watched the world fall around her, and she searched the pages for any way to stop it. It was then that she found the dragon's book, How to Make Magic. Suzuru 
opened the small book and ran her fingers down the chapters, and as she read, her eyes grew wide and her heart leapt and tears fell down her cheeks. Part one, she read, how to make light. Part two, how to make water. Part three, how to make air. Part four, how to heal. Every scrap of paper that Jack and Jemima had taken from the gods was written in full in the book gifted to mankind by the dragon. As fast as she could, Suzuru made copies of that book. Over and over she wrote, and as she wrote, she scattered the copies around the world. She changed nothing, not the title, not a single word. She wrote the book so often that she memorized every word and soon understood that inside it was the answer to every question mankind would ever ask. And people found the book. They shared the book, but like Jack and Jemima, they got greedy and they took it apart and hid bits of it and rewrote it and reshaped it to meet their own ends. And so it was another hundred years passed and still people hoarded and hid the wisdom of that little and so the great dragon released the pestilence on the people again. And all that time, Suzuru sat with the dragon and watched to see what mankind would do. And it broke her heart time and time again when people would find the truth, then hide it or edit it or change it or profit from it. And so humanity stumbled through its evolution. Suzuru would spread the book and humans would learn a little and then hide the truth, forcing the dragon to breathe on the earth again, over and over, through history, right until today. The book of magic is in the world. All the answers to all the questions right here. It's just hidden. Now it's time to open our eyes because the great dragon has breathed on us once more. So when we find the truth, it will be up to us to learn from our ancestors. We must be sure not to hide it or profit from it or alter it to suit our purposes. Only then will we be free of the dragon's curse and live a life of pure, true magic. And that's it from the Waffle Free Storytelling Podcast today. Have a most remarkable week. And uh, like I said, you want the waffle, go grab it in the show notes or drop around to www.tinaconstant.com and come and say hello. So hug the people you love, do something special for a stranger, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.